Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day to day, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Brad or Seen, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the murder of Mandy Stavick. Mandy was an 18-year-old girl who was brutally murdered while visiting home during Thanksgiving break in 1989. And despite authorities' best efforts to solve this case, it went unsolved for decades and actually just recently got resolution in 2019 in a very interesting way. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. Now, before I get into the details of today's case, I first need to say a big thank you to Skillshare for partnering with me on today's video. Now, if you're not familiar with Skillshare, don't you worry, you're gonna get familiar with Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform where lifelong learners can go and develop skills or, you know, fine-tuned skills that will benefit them for a lifetime. And I have been loving on Skillshare, man, for like over a year, I feel like. I'd have to go back and determine that. Like, don't quote me. Don't take my words as fact. But I feel like it's been like a year. And that's because like Skillshare's great, man. And they really benefit this channel because I do everything here myself, right? I write, I research, I edit. It's a whole, it is a lot. It is a lot of work. And I don't know if you know this, but this has like become my job. I don't know how that happened. It just kind of did. I spent almost a decade as a paralegal and then completely changed my work. And Skillshare has been really helpful in that because listen, the way we work in this world has been changing so much. And Skillshare has really been helping me fine tune skills that I already had and learn completely new skills that I can implement into this channel and into this new chapter of my life. So if you're anything like me, you're gonna love Skillshare because it's an online learning community that offers thousands of classes to a community of members across 150 countries. And they offer these classes in a variety of subjects from classes on things like social media success, productivity and time management. And what I'm most currently invested in, which is, well, okay, there's two different things. I'm really interested, I'm still looking into podcasting see if I can one day fit that into my schedule if I ever, you know, come up with another 10 hours a day for work, which, you know, we'll see. But also I've been really into, um, I'm learning Procreate. So I've been taking a lot of different classes on Procreate. So with that said, I recently started taking a class called Hand Lettering in Procreate, Fundamentals to Finishing Touches. And this class is taught by Gia Graham. And I've really been enjoying it because, okay, I have this merch design in my head where each word on the merch is written in like a different sort of lettering. So it's been super helpful to learn lettering, obviously, now that I've been playing around more with Procreate. Normally, my husband does all of the artsy stuff for me. Like that is his bread and butter. But now, with, you know, with Skillshare, maybe I could be an artist myself. You know what I mean? Or at least I'm trying. I'm learning. With Skillshare. And that's just one of the reasons that I personally find Skillshare to be so beneficial for my life. If you were to sign up for Skillshare, you would have access to a multitude of classes on pretty much any subject that your heart could desire. And you can do it all at your own pace. And that's something that's super important to me as a very busy person with a tiny person who depends on me. Like there's not a lot of free time for me, but you have to make time for yourself, or at least I have to make time for myself. I have to fill my cup a little bit in order to fill everybody else's cups. And this helps me do that. Now, Great news. Skillshare is offering the first thousand members of the Brat Pack that click the link in the top of my description box, the opportunity to peruse that all of Skillshare has to offer for free for one month today. So if you want to join a community of rad lifelong learners who are learning skills that will benefit them for a lifetime, make sure to click the link at the top of my description box to let them know that I sent you and peruse it all, peruse that, peruse all that Skillshare has to offer for free for one month today. Now I just want to say a big thank you to Skillshare for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Skillshare that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. Now. This is a wild case, dude. This is a case that when I was looking into it, it really made me kind of go through it emotionally. I was upset. I was angry. I was sad. It's scary. It's the type of case where the victim, Mandy, was doing something that any person does on any given day, right? She was just going on a neighborhood run. Well, maybe not any person, because you're not gonna catch me running unless somebody's chasing me, but you know what I mean. She was just snatched up while doing something that she had done a thousand times before without having any worry in her mind, you know what I mean? And then for something this horrible to happen to her and then it to go unsolved for so long, no one knew who did this to her for such 
a long time. And this is so very much one of those cases of if you see something, if you know something, say something, because that is how this case got solved after all of these years. So today I'm going to tell you that entire story. I read all the things so that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain while we go through all of the details of this case. Obviously I want you to answer it like once you have the information, but I'm going to give it to you now. And the question of the day is this, what do you believe was the motive for the murder of Mandy Stavick? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below after we go through all the details of this case. Now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of Mandy Stavick. Now, I want to start this video off with a quote. This is a quote from the Reverend who actually spoke at Mandy's funeral. He said to the crowd of Mandy, quote, whoever did this didn't just rob this beautiful young girl of her life. They robbed us all. Now, our story begins during the Thanksgiving holiday in 1989. It was Friday the 24th, the day after Le Feast, some might say. An 18-year-old Mandy Stavick, who was home visiting from college, was lacing up her light blue running shoes and leashing up her old pup, uh, Kyra. Kyra was a six-year-old German Shepherd, and the two were going to go on a run that Mandy had gone on like a thousand times because she lived there for a very long time, like her whole life mostly. Well, not her whole life. She had lived in the area for a long time before going off to college. This is something she did many, many times. She would run from her home on Strand Street to the Nooksack River and then turn around and run back. That's what her and Kyra would do. So Mandy and Kyra left the house at about 2.30 p.m. and then time ticked on. It ticked on and it ticked on. And after a little bit of time, Mandy's mom started to get worried because as I said, this was a very routine run for Mandy. She had done it a bunch of times and Mandy was a very routine and like scheduled girl. So her mom knew how long this run generally took. And the fact that she wasn't back yet was starting to make her a bit worried. Then her mother's anxiety raised a little bit more when Mandy's brother, Lee, the son of the family, sure. Lee comes home and he was like, huh, that's weird that Mandy's not here yet because I was outside of my friend's house and I saw Mandy running back towards the house. So she definitely should have been back by now. So that's just not good. Then for the cherry on top of this up cake, Kyra. Kyra comes back to the house alone. She's terrified. She's shaking. She's got like her, her tail between her legs and she's cowering. Her hindquarters are covered in what was called river silt. And I didn't know what that was. So I looked it up and it's described as kind of like minerals. It's like a specific type of mineral and it just kind of looks like mud. So she's wet. Her butt's all muddy. She looks terrified and she's totally alone. So where was Mandy? But first, who was Mandy? Amanda Teresa Stavick, who went by Mandy, was born April 16th, 1971, and she was one of four children born to her mother, Mary. She had an older brother named Brent, an older sister named Molly, and a younger brother named Lee. And her dad, I believe his name was Glenn, but I hardly saw any reports on him because he and Mary divorced when Mandy was pretty young and then her family moved away. They had previously lived in Alaska, actually, but moved to Washington when Mandy was in junior high. And when Mary came over, she came with her kids, but not with Glenn, as far as I've seen. So Mandy and her family, they came over to Washington. That's where they decided to set down roots plant roots, be trees. They decided to come to Washington and they moved into a super small community where Mandy's mom, Mary, got a job as a bus driver. And when I say a super small community, I mean, okay, for example, in 2020, so years after the events that we're talking about right now, years later, when there should be more people there, the population was only 120 people. So it's quaint, very small. This was a rural village in Whatcom County, the most Northwest County in Washington, actually. And it was about 15 minutes away from Bellingham where there isn't much like this place that they were living at. There wasn't much. There was just a general store, a post office, a gas station, a diner, an elementary school and two churches. So when you say like everyone knows everyone, you know, everyone knew everyone here. Or if you didn't know them, you'd see them. You'd be like, oh, I've seen that person because there's one store and we both shop there. The majority of people who had lived in this area had lived there for generations, like my grandma and your grandma, and they would hang out together by the fire, like that kind of vibe. They had a thing that I feel like a lot of us just don't have anymore. It's like a world that doesn't exist, you know, that missing and longing for a place that's just not real anymore. And that is like a real sense of community. This was a place where people knew each other. They knew each other's movements. And most importantly, they like really watched out for each other. Nobody's watching out for anybody where I live. And I've never lived in a place where anyone did. People ate at the same diner. They got their necessities at the same general store. They felt safe. You know what I mean? They didn't lock their doors. They left their keys in the ignition. There was lots of like 
farms and cows. It was just like a quaint, cute place. But anyways, Mandy. Mandy was an exceptional person. She was said to be fearless, even as a child, when she was about two years old, her mother had like, <laughs> this is so cute, but she had borrowed some bulls, like male cows, right? That belonged to her neighbor so that they could like eat the growth that was on her property. So she's like, hey, you got some extra bulls I can borrow because like I need some grass eaten up over here. And at this time, Mandy, as I said, was like two, so she was super small. And I guess she had gotten out the front door and she was small enough that she could just like walk under the gate where these bulls were. So she marches her little two-year-old butt up to these bulls. They freeze in fear. They don't, they're, they're scared of her. She wasn't scared of them. These giant bulls, she's not scared. She wants to play. Okay, obviously her mom, Caesar, comes out, scoops her up. She's terrified of what could have happened, but Mandy was fearless. She wasn't scared at all. Mandy's mother said that Mandy was everything. She couldn't think of any other word to describe her. She even said like, she wasn't sure how she was able to have Mandy as a child because she, Mary, considered herself to be such an ordinary person and Mandy was extraordinary. Everyone liked her. She was that girl. Like, okay, she was the type of girl who would help arrange groups to help encourage the other students to take part in blood drives and food drives, you know, like she cared about other people. She was special. Her mother doesn't know how she ended up being so special, but she was. And her mother said of her quote, she's one of these people who wants to leave the world a better place. The world needs people like her. She was bright. She was intelligent. She was vivacious. She was personal. She was the type of person that was always smiling and you can see in photos of her every single photo she's cheese and big time and you know when you can tell by a person's smile that they are a good person well look at her you've seen her you can clearly see the type of person she was just in the way her face lights up she was athletic she liked riding horses bareback running across fields playing softball basketball baseball track cheerleading she also played music she played the flute the clarinet and the saxophone the school band she was an honor student who spoke japanese and was fluent in sign language she did like everything like she was such an overachiever that when her mom found out she was going to try to take basketball and track at the same time which is like who has the lung capacity for that much movement not i said the cow quite frankly but anyways uh when she her, and her mom found out she was going to do that she was like you know it's going to be kind of hard for you i don't think you're going to be able to do both of these things at the same time and mandy was like you want to bet and her mom was like actually no i don't because you never bet against mandy about anything because you would lose one of mandy's teachers said of her quote she was a high achiever she wanted to do well in everything she did she had it all going for her she had a bright future ahead of her she was just the type of girl who like really stood out. You know what I mean? She did everything. And in addition to doing everything, she tried to do it well. She tried to do it the best that she could instead of trying to just like, I'm sufficient in a lot of things. No, I am the best at a lot of things. And her sister even said like, she accomplished so much with the short time she was given on this planet. And this part, oh my God, this will kill you. I don't know if it'll, it killed me. But when Mandy was still missing before her body had been found, her mother like put out a plea to the public and a plea to whoever had her daughter saying, quote, whoever's got her, don't hurt her. We need her back. She's got things to do. At the time she was killed, she had a boyfriend named Rick, and he said what he loved most about her was that she was so independent. The two had met in high school when he was a sophomore and she was a freshman, and he said that for some reason she loved him, even though he knew in his heart that she was like way out of his league. They were each other's like first big love. They had dated for three years, and of course they had broken up a couple of times, they were in high school, and they were still together though, you know what I mean? And he did seem like he loved her. Like when you watch interviews with him years later, he still, after all that time, seems like truly affected by what happened to Mandy. At the time of her murder, she was 18 years old. She had recently graduated from Mount Baker High School, which was like the high school where every single person in the story went. You'll see if I mention it. I, I, I can't remember if I mention it or if I will mention it, like in my notes, I've got it in my brain, but like most of the people we're gonna talk about in this case went to Mount Baker High School. So she had just graduated from there and she was in her first year at Central Washington University. And she was just home for the Thanksgiving break to have a little break from school before going back and getting on with her life when she was snatched from the street and snatched from this world. 
she had just gotten home from college like a day or two before she had spent some time with friends and then you know had the big thanksgiving feast on the thursday you know had the big dinner or lunch or you know it's 1 p.m when we do be eating thanksgiving i don't know about your family but it's 1 p.m when i do be eating thanksgiving dinner which really is like thanksgiving lunch that you eat from 1 p.m until you go to bed that night just periodically munch munch a munchin and then the next day it was friday and she laced up and grabbed kyra and went out for her run like normal and it's actually so sad because mary mary would normally go on this run with mandy like before mandy went off to school her and mary would do this run together uh, mandy would get on the bike mary would drive actually no no no, no. back up mary would get on her bike mandy would take kyra and She'd go off running, Mary would follow on the bike, the dog would do her best to try to keep up. But during this time, Mary's sister was visiting because it was the holiday, so she didn't go with Mandy because she wanted to stay and visit with her sister. And she had like a ton of guilt about the fact that she wasn't with her that day. But anyways, back to that day, Mandy out on her run. Her brother Lee is at his friend's house. He sees Mandy run by, going towards the river, like she would go on a run. Then he sees her, turn around, Run. Well, he didn't see her turn around, but he sees her running back in the direction of the house. So presumably she's going home. After some time, he leaves his friend's house. He goes home. He gets there and he's like, huh, that's weird. Mandy should be here by now. I saw her coming home. Like, where is she? So immediately Lee and Mary go out and look for her. And when they can't find her, they come back to the house and just sort of wait. Like, what else are they going to do at this time? They can't immediately think that something's wrong. But Mary said of this time, Quote, I was panicked. She was so consistent in what she always did. There was no reason for her not to come back. And then I can't even imagine the panic that her mother felt when Kyra came back without her. It reminds, this case reminds me so much of the Christina Williams case. Cause that was the case where the 13 year old girl had went off um, and walked her dog on the military base in California. And then the dog came back without her and she was just gone. And that's also another case that went cold for like a super long time and recently got resolution too. Now that I think about it. So they really do have a lot of similarities. It's probably why it's popping into my head. But anyway, Mary freaked out reasonably and she started calling everybody. She called her friends. She called her boyfriend, seeing if anybody had seen her and nobody had seen her and nobody had heard from her. So almost immediately with Mandy being presumed abducted, like they were like, okay, she's not missing. She was taken. That's an almost, almost immediately. That's the response she got. She got a crazy, she got the type of response that everybody who goes missing deserves to get. You know what I mean? We see so often when that doesn't happen, but they knew they were like, let's, go. So a massive hunt for her began. And this hunt was led by a man named like an officer named Ron Peterson. And they were using like every possible way to try to locate her. There were people on horses. There were helicopters in the sky. There were people on foot going door to door. There were Jeeps, every way that you could get across the terrain to try to look for her or in the sky. You know what I mean? they were doing. And in the meantime, Mary was calling anyone and everyone she could think of to come out and help in the search. So they could get as many feet on the ground as humanly possible. They knew right away that her being gone was an issue. Like something had to be wrong. She wasn't the type of girl to run away or anything like that. She even had plans with friends for that evening plans that she wouldn't miss. She wasn't just going to bail on people. That wasn't her way. There was nothing in her history to suggest that something like that would be the case. But her mom in the beginning said she, she didn't want to believe that Mandy could be gone. She, I think she basically was feeling like lightning couldn't strike the same place twice. And she ended up calling Mandy's older sister, Molly, and told her that Mandy was missing. And her sister echoed that lightning strike twice sentiment when she was like, this cannot be happening to us again. And I say that because and they said that because their family had already experienced a very similar tragedy. This is just like so insane and so tragic. I, I cannot believe it. Like when I think about this, I feel so bad for Mandy's family. But basically you remember how I said Mandy had an older sister named Molly, a younger brother named Lee and an older brother named Brent. Well, Brent had tragically died years before he had actually been killed in Alaska before the family had moved to Washington. So basically what happened is Brent had gotten permission to hunt 
on a like a military base called Fort Richardson. This was in Anchorage. He got permission to hunt on this military base and he was killed while doing so. And I read that he was just 16 years old. After Brent was killed, Mary received a call from the military to let her know that this had happened. And apparently what happened here is her son was shot 17 times in the head and chest. And I don't think they ever figured out who did this. Like Mary in an interview said she doesn't even have any idea the name of the person responsible. And I went on the internet and I scoured it and it looks like it's still unsolved to this day. 17 times. Okay, that's not an accident when you shoot somebody 17 times. So for her to have her son murdered in such a horrible way and for that to be unsolved and then to have her, her daughter, her teenage daughter go missing, I cannot even imagine what she was feeling. I, I truly cannot. Oh, and speaking of tragedy, before I forget one more thing, which is just like, there isn't a lot. There's like, this is probably going to be the only other thing I say about Mandy's father, Glenn, in this case, but it's something that was mentioned. And it's probably just because again, this family has gone through so much. Apparently Glenn, his stepson, so he divorces Mary, he gets remarried. He has a stepson. I believe he was 20 years old. His stepson drowned in a boating accident in 1988. So this family is just like surrounded by a cloud of just like sad death. And it's just, it's horrible. I, how does one group endure so much and come out? I do not understand. They did have a lot of support though. I guess that could be part of it. At least Mary did. I don't know about Glenn, but Mary definitely did. Everyone was out there looking for Mandy, checking on the side of the road and through all the acres and acres of land nearby. And they were hoping and praying that she'd be found alive. There were like jars on counters of businesses in the area so that people could donate money towards the search and rescue efforts and posters of her everywhere saying that she was missing and giving a description for people to be on the lookout for. She was said to have been wearing a light colored sweatshirt, dark green sweatpants, light blue running shoes with a purple stripe, a gold watch, silver hoop earrings. And she had her Walkman with her because she like loved to listen to music when she ran. She was 5'8". She was about 130 pounds. She had light brownish blonde curly shoulder length hair and brown eyes. Now, two days after Mandy went missing, the first piece of evidence was found that they thought could lead them or basically the first thing was found that gave them any sort of direction because they really weren't finding anything. And this was when in an overgrown, in an overgrown area, they found a pair of teal sweatpants. And you remember Mandy was said to have been leaving in a pair of like dark green sweatpants. So these pants stood out because the area where they were found, it was really like, it was like waterlogged. Everything was wet. It was really overgrown. And the pants stood out because they didn't seem like they had been there that long. Like they weren't as wet as the surrounding areas. So they were taken as potential evidence. But when Mandy's mom looked at them, she didn't believe that they belonged to her daughter the pants were like dirty and they had holes ripped in them. And she said that like her daughter just simply would not wear something that was in that condition. I mean, I can see why police were looking into it though, because like they were outside, she could have gone through something. There could be a reason that they were ripped and dirty. So they looked into them and they were able to retrieve fibers from them. And they actually were able to retrieve semen from them. And it was, they were sent to like the lab the lab to be processed. And it was determined that these were not related at all to Mandy's disappearance. It took three days from the time that Mandy went missing for her to be found. And she wasn't found in a way that anybody would want, obviously, or we wouldn't be talking about it today. Basically what happened is remember Ron Peterson, I told you he was a detective like leading the search Well, him and a team were in a boat and they were going down the river, searching the river. And they came to an area with a bend and they like, went off the main river and down a side channel in their boat when all of a sudden he saw something like in the distance in the water and what he was seeing was Mandy. Mandy was found floating in the Nooksack River and she was found a couple of miles away from her home and what Ron was seeing when he looked out in the water was her socks and her tennis shoes because that's actually all she was wearing at the time she was found. She was like on her stomach and her body had gotten sort of like cotton debris. And that's what stopped her from continuing to float down river. The area that she was in was sort of like, um, shallow, right? It was shallow. So Ron got out of the boat 
and he like retrieved her body and he flipped her over and he said when he saw her face it like really stunned him because of how much she looked like his daughter he said he had a daughter about the same age she had very similar characteristics so when he looked at her it was like very jarring for him and he just like held her and was like i got you now like i got you i'm gonna get you out of here and this like really affected him and stuck with him even years later in interviews when he talks about this you can tell like he's near tears even after all of this time and what's so eerie and so sad is that like even though she had been in the water for three days, she didn't really, like she had started to decompose. She didn't look all that different because the water had been so cold that it had like preserved her. So when they were looking at her in the water, she looked like you could just shake her awake. She looked like she was just asleep. So Ron's partner then had to go and deliver the news to Mandy's family that she had been found. And her mother said that she was shocked to learn she was dead but that she knew that deep inside she knew she felt that her daughter was gone. She said she had felt it like the whole time and that she didn't want to admit it, not even to herself. But that's why when she found out, she was just kind of like, well, obviously she had a stronger reaction than that, but like she knew that it was going, that it was coming. And at the time that she found out, um, Mandy's boyfriend, Rick was actually at the house and he had been upstairs, I believe. And he was watching through the window and he watched Mary get the news. And at that time he just knew as well that Mandy was gone. And then when Mary came inside and she confirmed to him what he had already believed, they just like fell apart. And then when Molly, Mandy's older sister found out about it, she lost it. She like started screaming. She ran outside and just started like screaming at the sky at the world at God, like, how could you let something like this happen to her? How can you do this to my family again? Mary has said that this is the type of thing that she wouldn't wish on her worst enemy, that this feeling is the worst thing you could possibly feel like there is nothing worse than losing a child. And she already knew this feeling. And now she had lost two of her kids. The medical examiner performed Mandy's autopsy the next day, and it was determined that her cause of death was actually drowning. And that was weird because Mandy was like a very strong swimmer. She was even a lifeguard at one point, like she could swim. And it was clear that she hadn't done this to herself, that like you could tell one, the condition she was found in, she was nude in the water with just her shoes and her socks. It was determined she had drowned, but she also had blunt force trauma to the top of her head. It wasn't enough to have killed her, but it definitely could have knocked her out. And on top of that, it was determined that she had been sexually assaulted. Now, at this time, DNA hadn't really been used. Like it wasn't being used to solve cases prior to about this time. I believe the first time it happened was in like 19... 86 in the UK. So we're right around that time, but not quite. But because Ron, the detective had just recently gone and did this whole, like this whole class with the FBI learning all about DNA. He knew that the time was now like, this was the time when he wanted to be very careful about saving things like this, because now we might actually be able to use any DNA taken from Mandy from the scene, all that to solve this case. So they needed to preserve it and then they needed to keep it so that they could investigate, find somebody to test it against and hopefully find the person responsible for doing this. But that was going to be the part that was going to be difficult and take like a lot of time. People were shocked. They were crying. They were scared. They were feeling so many things when it came to this happening to Mandy, not only the grief of losing her, but also the fear that like a very brutal, violent murderer was still out there. And they didn't know if he was going to strike again, the entire community was affected by this. This was the kind of thing that changed this place forever. It took a sense of innocence away from them. They were like, I could see this happening in a big city, LA, New York, Seattle even, but not here. This was the type of place that people moved to for the safety, the community, the quiet and the peace. They came here for like a slower pace at life and to just be able to do things without having to always be worried. And now they couldn't do that. Were people going to go out just jogging? Were girls just going to go out jogging now? No, that part of their lives was just gone. And everywhere people looked, they were worried they were seeing the person who had killed Mandy and everywhere people were looking, they were just seeing danger. The local store and other stores in the area started stocking up on mace. People started actually locking their front door, which they hadn't done before. And like a new self-defense class popped up that people could take. And it was called self-defense for gentle people. Like they were trying to do all kinds of things to protect themselves. And even Mary, Mandy's mom was like, this is the type of kook, she called him a kook, 
that will strike again. Like somebody's not going to do something like this and this be like the only thing they've ever done or ever will go on to do. This is what she's thinking in her mind. This is what most people would think in their mind. And it's so sad, dude, because Mary, she came out after this and was like, listen, I don't want to let my two remaining children go anywhere now. Like Lee and Molly, she's like, no, you're not going anywhere. And I totally get that, dude. To have two of your kids murdered, I, I, I couldn't deal with it, dude. I wouldn't. I, I don't even have words. I'm not even going to even try to have words for that, but I can understand why she felt the way she felt. And she said that like the local parents in her neighborhood, they like banded together to start sort of like a crime watch thing so that they could watch for each other, kind of like a neighborhood watch, but like for more serious crimes. And they were teaching their children who previously they didn't have to teach this kind of stuff, what they needed to do to protect and defend themselves. And what's super crazy is this fear and like uncertainty didn't stay contained to Mandy's hometown. It spread even where she went to school, to the college, the university where she was, it had spread there. People were scared there. Dorm rooms started having their locks changed. Uh, they had a memorial service for Mandy and like the kids there, the youths, the college students were for the first time really experienced, for most of them, obviously some people had experienced tragedy before because that's how life goes. But this was like showing them how fragile life really is, even at such a young age. It's something like that happening at that sort of age between like 14 to 20. I mean, I can't really say that. This is personal experience. It's very eye opening to have something very violent happen to somebody, you know, when you're in a formidable age, especially when you're at that age where you feel invincible, untouchable, nothing can happen. You know, it can, but it's not going to happen to you. And then it happens to somebody close to you, somebody you knew well, or somebody that you just knew in passing, and it changes you. It just does. This was also a very publicized case. Every TV station, radio station, newspaper, they were all covering Mandy's story. Even outside her state, people all over were affected by Mandy's murder. Like Mandy's mom got letters from all over the place people all over the country that had never met Mandy, but were still affected by what happened to her. Everyone saw somebody they knew in Mandy, their own friends, sisters, daughters. It was like her basketball coach said, Mandy's legacy was one of love. Nearly a thousand people attended Mandy's memorial service. It was so large that there weren't any churches within miles that could house so many people. So her memorial service ended up taking place at her like old school auditorium. And this was so intense for her mother because she like knew, she knew her daughter was special, but she didn't realize just how many people Mandy had touched throughout her years on this earth. And she said it was really hard for her because like, so much of her wanted to preserve Mandy and keep her just for herself, keep her memory just for herself. But in losing her, she had to kind of share her with the world. Mandy's basketball coach did a eulogy at her funeral. Is it, is there one eulogy? My brain is not remembering how funerals work. It's been quite some time, thankfully, but I know there was a reverend, but also her basketball coach did a or the eulogy because they were apparently very close. Like, it was more than just a mentoring through sports type situation. Like after, you know, her mom and her dad got divorced, this guy was like a father figure to her. And she had even written him like a card at one point saying that he was like the most inspirational and um, influential person like in her life. So they were very, very close. Her uncle also spoke to the audience. He was the person who spoke like for her family. They, he was their spokesperson. And he said to the audience for her family, quote, when we felt fear and anger, you gave us love. When we felt grief, you grieved too. Here in the depths of mourning, we can feel healing begin. A song was written for Mandy that was performed at her funeral and it was called Mandy Song. And in it, there was a line that said, quote, in our hearts, you will always be a very special memory, Mandy, end quote. And the song was performed at the funeral by some of her friends and it was super emotional. The whole thing was emotional. Poinsettia plants were lined around the track where Mandy used to run for her, you know, track. She was in track. So around the track that she would run, there were poinsettia plants and there were TV news stations there. Like this was definitely a more public, public situation. But then after the memorial service, there was a private graveside burial at St. Joseph Mission Cemetery, just for those that were closest to her. 
about two dozen of Mandy's family members and friends were present at the private graveside burial and uh, she was cremated. So it was her ashes that were buried. And this cemetery was super close to her mom's house. I think it was just like a half a mile. So she would easily be able to, to visit. And the Reverend said, you know, there's a part of us that never dies like during her, her funeral. That's what he said. And I guess, you know, that's the part that her mother gets the opportunity to visit. During the graveside funeral, her boyfriend, Rick, was one of the people that were there. And he was there holding a teddy bear that belonged to Mandy. And you can see um, a photo of this. I found a clip from newspapers.com where you can see him. In the article, it says, like, a friend was standing there with Mandy's teddy bear, but it was Rick. And it's so sad. Like, it destroyed my heart. He said that he had to, like, after she was killed, he went back to college and he, like, retrieved some of her things. And one of those things was that teddy bear. And he said that it like smelled like her. And then he broke down. Oh God, see, it's going to get me again. And then he broke down in that moment saying that like the smell had faded and that like, I don't know what it was about that. It just messed me up a little bit. After Mandy was killed in late December. So, you know, about a month after Mandy was killed, 40 people met at Mary's house and they got together because they were planning to do like a demonstration, essentially. They said they wanted to get together and stand against fear. So basically they all got together and they were going to hold hands and they were going to march down Strand Street. They were going to take the walk that Mandy would have ran, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't know why the sentence isn't coming out good. Probably because I don't sleep because I have a baby that doesn't sleep, but you know what I mean? They held hands and they walked down this, this stretch of road, which is where Mandy had ran because they were saying that they didn't want fear to control and dictate their lives. They said that their love was stronger than the fear that they were all feeling. They wanted to make the choice to not live in fear. So they walked all the way to the cemetery where Mandy's ashes were buried and they said a prayer for her before going back to Mary's to just sit and talk and remember Mandy. And Mary said that this was like a very good thing for her because one, it helped her, you know, remember her daughter, helped other people remember her daughter, but it also showed her that despite there being a lot of ugliness in this world and horrible things, there was still some love and beauty as well. Now back to the investigation, police were able to put together the route that Mandy had taken that day. But like, obviously her mom's like, I know what route she took, but you weren't actually there. So you can't know for sure that she did take that route. So they were able to piece together the route that she took based on the eyewitnesses from people who had actually seen her out on that run that day. And they were able to tell where she was at what particular time. They determined that Mandy had started her run at, from her mother's home, obviously, which was on a dead end road that was about a mile from the highway. And then she ran west towards Strand Street. And Strand Street was a two lane long road with like fields and trees and what looked like farming land on either side of the road. The area where she had ran was pretty remote. Like there were houses, but not very many. And each of the houses were on like giant plots of land, like acres and acres between neighbors. So they were pretty sparse, pretty spread out, but people were there. Right. And this area is actually like super duper beautiful. I looked it up like photos on a map, you know, and it's a gorgeous area. But the point is that it's very remote. She ran to the river. Then she started to run back. And that's what they were able to determine. And they were able to determine that she had at least made it to the river and started to head back because her brother Lee, remember, saw her when he was at his friend's house, saw her run and then start heading back. And also a man in a pickup truck had seen her running towards her house. And she was only about a quarter mile away from her own home when this person saw her. They also came to the determination that Mandy had to have been abducted by somebody who had a vehicle because Mandy was just like far too fast on her feet for anybody to catch her. She was like a very fast runner. They also determined that whoever did this must have had some sort of weapon to subdue her and get her into their vehicle, which is probably true. But then I think of cases like Mickey Shunick. If you've seen my video on that, Mickey Shunick was riding her bike when she was hit, like the person hit her with their vehicle and then abducted her. So when I think of things like this. I'm like, what you're saying is most likely true, but like anything could possibly happen. But that's what they had determined that there was probably a weapon used. She was forced into a vehicle and they figured that whoever did this was either local or the luckiest son of a bitch in the world. Police were even able to determine the spot that they believe Mandy had been abducted from. So basically they brought in a tracker and this tracker followed all of the clues that one would follow in order to determine where somebody had 
been. I don't know anything about this science, but basically they followed all the tracks from her and from Kyra. And they were able to find a spot where her track stopped and Kyra's tracks just completely stopped. They were able to see in that area, like in the shoulder, on the shoulder of the road, there was like some disturbed grass. It looked like perhaps a scuffle had taken place, which, you know, lines up their track stop. All of a sudden there looks like there was a scuffle between one or two people. And there was a river with river silt, like right there. And you remember that Kyra, her butt was all covered in river silt. So they were like, okay, this is most likely where she was taken from. They believe that this dick kicked Kyra, kicked the dog into a ditch so that they could abduct Mandy, which is really, I was thinking about this. This is such a bold move, right? To abduct a girl in broad daylight who has a German shepherd with her. That is a ballsy move, but they think that, you know, this person kicked the dog. The dog went into a ditch and that's why the dog came back wet terrified, shaken up, losing its mind. And they even wanted to try to take the dog to see if the dog could lead them to, you know, anything before, I guess, before the tracker came. I don't know. They wanted to see if the dog could lead them to where she had been taken. But Kyra was so freaked out that she was of no use for investigators. They believe that whoever abducted her took her miles away from the area where she was abducted. And that's where they attacked her and sexually assaulted her. They believe that she was actually able to escape at one point because when her body was recovered, she had cut marks. She had scratches and cuts on her arms, her legs, and on her, her buttocks. And they believe this was from when she was running away from her abductor. And this area had a lot of um, blackberry bushes and apparently blackberry bushes, which I did not know until this case, have like big thorns. And they believe that these thorns were what was cutting into her as she ran from the person who had been attacking. It was believed that she was chased down and she was caught and then she was struck in the top of her head and that's why she had the blunt force trauma to her head. They think that this likely knocked her out and then her captor placed her in the river where she either sank and drowned or they held her there until she was dead. Which is just so fucking dark, man. And as far as I can tell, they never did find the crime scene and they never did find the area where she was placed in the water. She was just, you know, in the water and she had floated for a while. So they weren't able to find the place where she had been put in the water. And then she got caught on that debris. And that's why they were able to find her in that shallow water where she was recovered. Now, as I mentioned, just like in passing earlier in this video, Ron Peterson, the guy who was leading the search for Mandy, he had recently taken a class like on DNA collection with the FBI. So when they found Mandy's body, he knew that the way that they recovered her, the way that they got her out of the water and the way that they recovered the DNA was very important. They needed to do everything in their power to preserve anything they had left. He said his biggest fear was disturbing any DNA that was on her body when they took her out of the water, because really they were going to have a hell of a time retrieving anything, if anything was even still there because she had spent days in the water. Anyways, he used his training. They got her out of the water and they were able to retrieve DNA from her body. And it was a very specific type of male DNA that was found on her. I'm sure you can put two and two together. And that's part of what helps them realize before obviously doing an examination, the dark things that had happened to her prior to her being killed. From there, they needed to figure out who had done this. So they were like, okay, who is fucking weird. Who is somebody who sticks out in this community that people would have bad feelings about? It has to be somebody who like this person has to have some other sort of weird tendency if they're going to go on to do something like this. Tips definitely came in. People were like, oh, I can tell you who's weird. I got some weird people up in this bitch that we can talk about. And they definitely had a list of, I think definitely a lot. They had a list of men that they wanted to look at that maybe possibly could have a reason Maybe not so much of a reason, but they were like, we, we got to start somewhere. So they had a list. One of the first people they wanted to look into, or at least one of the people on their short list in the beginning, well, they had a long list in the beginning. Let me backtrack. One of the people they looked at in the beginning was actually one of the last people who saw her alive. This was, I believe, a man named Paul. And it's the guy in the pickup truck who saw Mandy when she was running by. And I think they looked into him for a couple of reasons. One, he like lived close by and she was abducted from near her home. Uh, he had told police that he had seen a vehicle with like tinted windows, I believe it was, that was near Mandy at the time, but he was pretty vague about his description. And they kind of felt like it was possible that he was inserting himself into the investigation. And this is something that some killers do do sometimes. Do do sometimes. 
So anyways, those reasons made police look harder at him. So they start looking into them. They actually ask him for a DNA sample and he says no. So they had to actually get a court order. They get his DNA and it turns out he's not a match. They also looked into another man. This was a, I was going to say a local drifter, but like, that's not a thing. I don't think you can be local and a drifter. I think drifter by default would mean that you are not local. So they looked into a drifter because they're like drifter. Of course, it can't be somebody who's from our community. We're too good, too close. So they look into him because, you know, he's an outsider. He could be a weirdo. We don't know. But they look into him, they test his DNA, and he too was excluded. Police were also trying to locate a man who had been seen in the area when Mandy disappeared. They were able to put together a composite sketch of this man who was said to have been white, 30 to 35 years old, with a pudgy face and cheeks, dark hair, a mustache, and some stubble. And this sketch was distributed amongst people everywhere, like all over the place, but it actually never really went anywhere. I don't know who this guy was. And then later when we find out who actually did this, he didn't really fit this description. So I'm not really sure who this guy was, but they put this out and it was in the newspapers and it didn't come to anything. So that's another dead end. Obviously police wanted to look into Mandy's boyfriend at the time, because how often is it the boyfriend, husband, partner, all the time, all the time. So they look into him and he said that he actually understood. Rick was like, listen, I get why you're looking into me. I'm actually glad that you are because it means that you're doing the most and all the things that you should be doing because I want you to catch my girlfriend's killer. And police looked into him. They said he was super helpful. He was super forthcoming. He was very open even about like things that weren't like great in their relationship, like the fact that they had broken up several times, but he too was looked into, his DNA was tested, and he was not matched. So again, another dead end. This case was dead end after dead end after dead end. Police looked into every possible lead where this case was concerned, and they received new leads every day. They followed hundreds of leads. They had made a DNA profile, obviously. They like put, like they didn't make it, they had it. <laughs> they fabricated this DNA profile. No, they didn't. They didn't do that. They had their DNA profile and they ended up taking DNA from like 30 different dudes. Okay. And they tested all of them against the DNA profile they had. And each time they were like, is this going to be him? Is this going to be him? And then it wasn't. And they were getting their hopes up and getting so like ready to get it solved. They wanted to solve this case. It was so hard to have an unsolved murder in this small community. They were so tight knit. Everyone knew everybody. All of these officers, a lot of these officers that were working the case looked at Mandy and saw like their own daughter. You know what I mean? They had a lot of a lot of personal investment in getting this solved, not just professional investment. So with each person that they tested and it came back that it wasn't them, they were just losing hope that they were going to solve this case. And with each exclusion of a suspect, they were just like, who the fuck is this guy, dude? Direct quote. Now you may be hearing this case and be thinking, a young girl found in a river in Washington in the eighties. I don't know why I'm doing that, but you might be hearing that and thinking that sounds familiar. That might be because you're thinking of Gary Ridgway. Now, if you're not familiar with Gary Ridgway, Gary Ridgway was an American serial killer who killed a lot of women in the eighties. He did most of his work. He killed most of his victims in Washington and Oregon. Oregon was a little bit, but it was mostly in Washington. And what he would generally do is pick up vulnerable women, oftentimes sex workers. He would strangle them. He would assault them. And then he would put their bodies in rivers. And he was known as the Green River Killer. Now it was speculated that Mandy might've been a victim of the Green River Killer because she did fit his profile sort of, right? She was a young white woman who was killed and found in water. And he did kill young women and put them in water in Washington in the eighties. So it makes total sense that they would put those two, two and two, sometimes make four, sometimes they don't make four. It always makes four, but it didn't in the situation. So basically once they had gone through all of their leads, they actually reached out to the Green River Task Force. And they're like, Hey, this is what we have. They gave them everything they had on Mandy, like their whole file. And they're like, look at this and please tell me if she is one of yours. Cause they were desperate. And the Green River Task Force looked at it and they're like, I'm sorry, but no, like she doesn't fit his profile. She's not, she wasn't killed by him. So now they are back to square one. And with this, not with this, but this in conjunction with all of the other leads that they had followed and had not gotten any resolution with the case went cold and it would stay cold for two 
decades. But that is not to say that nothing happened during that time. Over the years, Mandy's friends and family did everything they could to ensure that leads were still coming in and that her case wasn't forgotten. Crime Stoppers got involved and they actually um, donated some money towards a reward fund that was set up for, you know, you know, give us, if you lead, give us information that leads to an arrest, we're going to give you this money. You, we've heard it. We've seen it. It happens. And there was actually several funds set up for, you know, a reward fund. There were also like fundraisers done just to raise money to help Mandy's family during this time. There was a lot of things going on that involved finance. Sure. And Mary did everything she could to keep her daughter's name her case in the public eye. She did not want people forgetting about her daughter. She would do interviews and she would just say, listen, I'm trying to tell my story as much as I possibly can. So somebody out there can see me, can hear this story and hopefully come forward and help me figure out who murdered my daughter. But still nothing came of it. 25 years went by and they still had no promising suspects, but they had to keep moving forward, keep being persistent, just keep going. They said that Mandy was dead, but that her case would not die. Like, I cannot stress just how affected people were by her murder. Even decades later, quote, tough, hardened cops were shedding tears about this case. They'd get choked up just talking about Mandy, which is kind of incredible and honestly speaks to the impact she had over this small community. Mandy's mother was destroyed. People would tell her that she was so strong, that she was such a strong person for going through what she went through and keeping her head up. But she said that you cannot be strong through something like this because it rips you to pieces. And she said that she truly did not believe that her daughter's case would ever be solved. She said that officers told her that they do everything they could to make sure that they brought the person who did this to justice. But she said with every day that went by, every year that went by, she just continued to lose hope. And she truly did not believe she would ever know who had killed her daughter. But they did try. Police were trying. Um, detective Kevin Bowie ended up being assigned to the case. He was the third detective to take over Mandy's case. And Detective Kevin Bowie is one of the people that I talked about in the beginning who went to the same high school as Mandy. Not the same year. He was uh, a little bit older than her, but the same high school. He was a young deputy at the time that Mandy was murdered. Like he wasn't like a detective and working on the case. He was a young deputy, but by 2009, he had been the person who was appointed to take over the case. And he said that he had never forgotten Mandy. He tore through the case file, looking at all the evidence they had, who had been questioned, what they had said. He even went as far as tracking down a previous person that investigators had spoke with that he had like a feeling about. And this person had moved to Cambodia and this cop, this cop, Kevin Bowie went to Cambodia to question this guy again but it too was a dead end. Now, running out of options, Officer Kevin decided he wanted to do a DNA sweep. So basically he had his officers go door to door to everyone essentially and ask them for a DNA sample. They had lists of hundreds of people that they wanted to get DNA samples from. So those officers would go knock on the door, ask the people, they would send batches of DNA samples to the lab and get them all tested to see if any of these people were a match. So he got the idea to do this based on a book called The Blooding. And this book was based on a case out of England where a DNA sweep was used to solve the murders of 15 year old Linda Mann and 15 year old Don Ashworth. Now these murders happened three years apart and about a mile away from each other. And when Linda was killed, it went unsolved. But then when Don was killed years later, a man actually confessed, but he only confessed to Don's murder, not Linda's. And police were convinced that the same killer had killed Polk both girls. So when they tested the DNA, they found like the DNA on both of these girls, they found that it was true. The same person had killed both girls and it was not the guy who confessed. Now, why did he confess? I don't fucking know, dude, but they tested his DNA and he didn't do it. So they did a DNA sweep and they got DNA samples from thousands of men in nearby villages. And long story short, they got their guy. It was some dickhead named Colin Pitchfork. Anyways, this is where he got his idea. So they go to the door, they ask people for the samples. A lot of people gave it willingly. There of course were several people that were like, nah dog, I'm not giving you shit. Because you know, there are a lot of people who are very protective over their, you know, information, their biological samples. And there are a lot of people who are just um, not super keen on the government and the police anyway. Now you're gonna be shocked to hear this, but the DNA sweep, it was unsuccessful. So time marched on. 
again. And then it was June of 2013 and they got their first real lead, their first actual like legit suspect. So here's what happened. There were these two local girls. Well, I guess women by this point, but they were girls at the time. Like when Mandy disappeared, they were girls who lived in the area. Obviously local girls get it together. Brittany. So these girls by now are two moms. They're two moms hanging out at a water park when they get to talking. They're chatting to each other and Mandy comes up because this is one of the biggest things that's ever happened in their area. So of course it's going to come up. And one of the girls is like, listen, I'm fairly certain I know who killed Mandy Stavick. And the other girl was like, yo, same. So these girls were Heather and Marilee. These women were Heather and Marilee. So they're just sitting there on the grass watching their kids play, having this conversation when they decide that they both have an idea who killed Mandy. So they're like, one, two, three, go. Let's say it on three, say who we think it was. That's not really what they did, but they both did say who they thought it was. And they realized in that moment that both of them over all these years had an idea who did it. And both of them were thinking of the same guy. They both thought that the same guy was responsible, but they had never said anything to anyone. They had never said anything to police. Marilee has come out and said that the reason she never said anything to anyone, never said anything to police is because she wasn't sure. And it was like a small town and she didn't feel comfortable or safe accusing somebody of potentially being involved with an 18 year old girl's murder when you had no proof and just like a gut feeling. But now with her and Heather sitting together and both of them saying the same name, they were like, oh shit, like this might be something that we should tell somebody. Now, why did they think that this guy could be responsible? Why did they think this guy was a suspect? Well, it turns out that both of these women had had some pretty creepy run-ins with him around the time that Mandy was killed. So first we'll talk about Heather. It was summer of 1989, a couple of months before Mandy was killed and Heather was 15 and this guy was 20 and they had been at like a baseball game or a softball game. And after the game was done, I believe they won. So they wanted to go to Dairy Queen to like celebrate as people do. So they all piled in this car together and they're driving over. And in this vehicle with Heather sitting beside her was this guy, this 20 year old guy who was 20 then, but isn't 20 now. But anyway, they're sitting next to each other. She said he was sitting beside her and he was telling her how beautiful she was, how beautiful her eyes were. And then he like grabbed a pen out of like the cup holder next to, next to him and started rubbing it around her kneecaps because she was wearing like cut off sweatpants. And it's just something about the interaction made her super uncomfortable. Something about the, the nothing behind his eyes made her skin crawl. And keep in mind, he's 20 and she's 15. So either way, this is fucked up. So that's weird, right? It, in isolation, it might not be so weird. It's definitely something that like is not inappropriate, but it's not super weird. But then we get to Marilee and her situation was a little more, a little scarier. It's June of 1991. So this is a, like a year and a half after Mandy was killed. And she was a mother by this point. She's at home with her son at night when she hears a knock on the door. She opened it and she found this guy this guy that they're suspecting standing on her doorstep. And he asks if he can use her phone. He says that he's been out hunting all day and he wants to call his wife so that she won't worry. So can I please come inside and use your phone? And she's like, sure. She lets him come in. He starts using her phone, but she quickly realizes that he's pretending to use her phone while he's got the phone to his ear, you know, making a call. She can hear the dial tone and she can hear the like, I'm sorry, but your call is not connected or whatever you remember, right? You remember house phones, right? I feel like most of the people, that watch my videos, remember this time and remember that sound very distinctly in their heads. But anyway, this is what she's hearing while he's pretending to call his wife. She hears this. She knows he's not really on the phone. He puts the phone down and then just starts walking through her house. Okay. He walks towards her bedroom and he's saying weird shit, like how he used to always drive by her house and how he'd like look in her windows and how he had always been in love with her and then tells her, I would very much like to bang you right here, right now. Direct quote. It's not a direct quote, but that's the, that's what's happening while well, she's alone in this house with her son. She was not down with this sickness and kindly told him to fuck off. But he was like, no, you know, I don't think I'm going to, I think I'm going to stay. And it was at this point that she got terrified and she freaked out and she told him like, I'm going to call the cops if you don't get out of here right now. And at this point, he decided to vacate the premises. He doesn't want police involved. He's got something to hide. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, probably, yes, yes he does. 
So now these ladies, they're adults, they've moved on with their life. They have these memories in their head. And now they're speaking to somebody else who also had a weird experience with this person. And it validates what they had been feeling, you know, it, there's safety in numbers. So they realize like, we need to tell someone. So Marilee actually contacts a cop that she knows another guy. All of these people went to Mandy's high school, by the way, remember how I said so many Marilee, Heather, the guy that we're talking about this cop, his name was Ken Gates. She calls him and she's like, Hey, I think I know who might have killed Mandy. When she tells the officer the name of the person that they think is responsible for killing Mandy, they realize that this person during the time that Mandy went missing in the eighties, he lived right in the same neighborhood as Mandy. He actually lived on the street that she took her running route. He lived right on that street, but he had never been looked at by police. He was never a suspect. He had never even really been questioned about this because he was super well liked in the community. His family was well liked in the community. He went right under the radar. Nobody thought he was weird at all, but now he was on police's radar and he was their prime suspect. And this was a man named Timothy Forrest Bass. But we're going to talk all about Timothy next week. I am so sorry, but this is such a long case with so much information. The way they go about catching this guy is super wild. The way he acts when he gets caught is super intense. The way he tries to sully Mandy's like memory and who she was, the way he tries to blame one of his own family members for the murder is disgusting. We'll discuss his connection to Mandy or his lack thereof. There is just so much more to go through. And when I looked at my notes, I knew it was too much for one video and there had to be a part two. So make sure to come back and watch it. I'm always super surprised. Like I haven't done a lot of two parts. I think I've only done like, like less than, like I think I can count them on one hand, but I'm always surprised by how many people come and watch the first video and don't watch the second video. I don't know how you live your life like that. I could not do it. Like I need to know the full story. I need resolution, but some people really do be out there wild. And <laughs> But with that said, that my friends is the story of the murder of Mandy Stavik so far. I hope you found it interesting and informative and I gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case so far. And of course I want to thank you for remembering Mandy with me today. Now, considering everything I told you so far in this video, I want to revisit the question of the day. And that was this, what do you believe was the motive for the murder of Mandy Stavik? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. Before you go, please don't forget to leave me a comment down below of what case you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you know, I have a long list of cases and anytime you leave me a suggestion, I put it on the list with your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest because they're often cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put on a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below along with a link to my membership where you get early access to non-sponsored videos, priority comment responses, things like that. And now I just want to say one last thank you to Skillshare for partnering with me on today's video and a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock, don't ever change. And now with all that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight you are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video.